I've, I've labeled this series The Invisible War because uh, for the next four weeks, I want us to talk about spiritual battle and spiritual conflict. And you and I, whether you know it or not, it might be the news that we experience personally. It might be the news of a loved one that's going through a difficult time. You know what? Who can watch the news today and not be affected by what is going on in the world around us? We are in a spiritual battle. It is a battle of cosmic proportion. We face a real opponent. This world bears the scars of the conflict, wars, genocide. One of the, one of the least desirable words in the English language is hate. It doesn't even sound like a nice word. Hate. Yet the world bears those scars, shattered lives, broken homes, abuse, addictions. John Milton in his great works, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, it speaks about the great cosmic combat that takes place in uh, Revelation chapter 12. We're not going to turn there, but it says this, describing that chilling chapter of Revelation, Milton says that the forces of heaven and hell are the central focus and earth is the battleground on which this cosmic battle takes place. Don't for one moment think that we are innocent bystanders in the invisible war. We are foot soldiers, folks. And no matter what you see around us, guess what? Greater is he. Amen? Amen. The church, we often lose sight of this spiritual struggle. We often lose sight that we have been called to wage war against those who oppose God's righteousness and rule. Now, let me say this. I, I am not abdicating that we make a posse and we go out and we, we enact violence, okay? Here's what I'm calling us to do to do what God calls us to do, to live morally, to live uprightly. I'm going to say this, to vote, okay? The, the, believe it or not, that's coming up. Hard to believe. We're almost there. Vote the way God would have you to vote. If you come up and ask me who to vote for, I'm not going to tell you. That's not what I'm here for. You vote according to how God calls you to vote. We need to know that there is a rebellion going on in this world. It is a war against God, God's angels, God's church. You are the church and God's people. We know him by many names, do we not? And we're going to go through some of those today. We know that Satan is a created being but he wanted to be worshipped, he wanted to be served like the Creator. It was this attitude that led him to rebel against God and to seek and to establish his own kingdom. You know what? When you're in a war, reconnaissance is huge. Okay? Uh, you got to get to know things about an upcoming situation or battle, don't you? Okay? So the recon kind of works like this. They'll send little parties out and they'll, they'll be looking at things and they'll be marking off how many feet to this or, or how many guards are here and what's going on there. Why do they do that? They want a clear picture of the enemy. They want to know what they are up against. Folks, we need to know what we're up against. The best recon that we can do when it comes to invisible war is to get into God's word and know what we're up against. But remember this. Greater is he. Never, ever forget that. The Bible gives us insight into how Satan operates, where he comes from, who he is, and guess what? Gives us the tools that we need to repel the fiery darts of the evil one. Okay, We're going to be talking about that uh, next week and the week after, but I want us to look... We're going to look at Satan's origin or his original state. We want to see uh, Satan's rebellion and his fall. He has many titles and many names, and he also has power. And we're going to talk about these things this morning. So his origin, his original state, 
is this. Um, people will say Satan has always been. Uh, no, he has not. Okay? Uh, Satan has not always existed. He and all other angels, uh, they were created. And we see this in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, verses uh, 12 through 17. Verse 12 says this. Thus says the Lord God. Now, whenever you see that, uh, that's kind of like that blinking neon light. Pay attention. Okay? Thus says the Lord God. You had the seal of perfection in all of creation. There was never another being created as perfect as Lucifer. Okay? He didn't always exist. He was created. Okay? The created is never better than the creator. Okay? And there's a lesson for us there too. For those of us that think we are in the center of our universe, uh, Flo, you and I were created. There is no way in the world I am going to outshine the creator. What do I do if I do that? Hey, well, yeah, I'll go with that. You know what? It is, it is the sin of pride. The last part of verse 12 states that he was full of wisdom. Throughout all God's works, no creature could be found to match the marvelous wisdom of Lucifer. He was the wisest of all created beings. It also says that he was perfect in beauty. He was perfect in beauty. You know what? To look upon him, you would have said, whoa! He was perfect in that way. We see also in verse 13, it states that he dwelled in Eden, the garden of God. He was privileged uh, to be in the residence of God's paradise. Every precious stone was your covering. We all love precious stones, don't we? Aren't those nice, you know, ladies? Ah, it's, it's, time, it's, it's time to get married. And so you all go out, and you look at the diamonds, and then uh, my, my bride, bless her heart, you know, she, she likes diamonds. Who doesn't, right? But then she'll say, hey, look at that pretty green one. Yeah, look at that red one. And she can tell me, uh, I'll say, what's that? And she'll say, oh, it's this. To me, a rock is a rock, okay? It's a rock with a price tag. That's all it is, okay? Think of, think of every precious stone was your covering. It exemplified his brilliance. The unsurpassed privileged portion afforded to Lucifer. His position was so high, his position is so lofty, the description is that of him uh, having and wearing precious jewels. Verse 14 of uh, Ezekiel 28, you were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and what does God say? I placed you there, that position given by God. He was created by God as the anointed cherub. Verse 14 also tells us that Lucifer was given a place on God's holy mountain. It says this, in the ESV version, it says, you were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walk. The terminology, stones of fire, they believe it speaks of the holiness of God. Lucifer enjoyed the very presence of God. What greater testimony could there be to a created being? God's commendation there. Verse 15 tells us that he was blameless from the day of his creation. It says, you were blameless in your ways from the days you were created. What a testament 
to God's creation. You were blameless. From the moment you were made, the day came, however, when unrighteousness was found in him. What did this unrighteousness entail? It was his spirit of rebellion against God. I think of this, and I think of such a lofty position. I can't even, I can't even wrap my mind around it. Lofty position, enjoying the very presence of God. And that was not enough. He wanted more than that. It says in verse 17, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, revealing that the archangel allowed his perfection to be caused of his corruption. Pride in the heart is the beginning of a fall. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Satan had a special place of prominence in his service to God. Yet it was not enough. Why is that important for us to know and to understand? Because the question is begged of us. Are you content this morning with your position before God? You see, throughout God's word, there are so many things that we can learn. Every verse has something. I firmly believe that. Okay? Even the genealogies. How many of y'all, when you're reading through God's word, you get to the genealogies and you just go, ay, 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 ay. Judy, have you ever gone, like, you know, the book of Numbers is really big on this, right? Have you ever stopped and said, I'm going to pronounce every single name in there. Have you ever done that? Okay. I tried that once. I got through about five verses, and I said, I, they didn't name him Jim and Sam and Bob. Okay? But there's something that we can learn in God's word from every verse. You know, for example, the genealogies. If nothing else, Judy, I have learned this, and I've seen it over and over again. God is a God of order. God is a God of order. He put that in there for a reason, and we can trace back, you know, and we can see things in God's word. Uh, nothing happens by chance. Your children were not born to you by chance. God knows. The genealogies tell me that. We can also see things of what not to do, okay? We see Lucifer's position. We see rebellion that creeps in. It wasn't enough. Okay? He was basically saying, God, I am better than you are. Uh, how about you this morning? The position that you have in Jesus Christ. Remember this, folks, never lose sight. Uh, Jesus is king. And I am not. And you know what? We should be okay with that. We should be okay with that. It also goes along with what we are doing for the kingdom. Okay? Can I say this? I praise God for all of you. I praise God for our church family that are here faithfully to clean the church. Y'all would know this if it wasn't done. Guaranteed. I praise God for those that come in and do such a wonderful job keeping God's house clean. I praise God for those of you that, that go out and visit and pray with our folk. You will never know. I praise God for those that clean up the kitchen after one of our family fellowship dinners that we have, our meal of sharing. I absolutely love those. There is no such thing as second string in the kingdom of God. We are all of use and value to the kingdom. You know what? God has put us each in the position that we are in. And God calls us to be faithful to him. And he is going to bless. That is what God calls us to do. Are you satisfied with your position in Christ? Don't ever for one moment think 
that what God has called you to do is beneath you. God has you right where he wants you. And isn't it cool to know he grows us? He does. He grows us. I never dreamed in a million years I'd be a pastor. I was shy when I was a kid. Judy, that was a long time ago. But God grows us. And as we grow in grace and knowledge, he moves us, he grows us. How comfortable are you with your position in Christ? Let God guide your steps. Be willing to move your feet when he guides your steps. And don't ever forget that creator God is exactly that. He is the creator. I'm a broken pot. God uses broken pots. God uses cracked pots, doesn't he? Amen. He does. Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, verse 15, that tells us about Satan's rebellion and fall. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity, till sin was found in you. And then verse 17 adds, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. It says, I cast you to the ground. Verse 18 was God's response to this sin. I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. God cast this angel out of heaven to eventually be destroyed. We also see this in Isaiah chapter 14. It records this event. It says, How have you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. Satan's sin originated in pride, it grew into self-deception, ended in rebellion. Lucifer sought to exalt himself to the position of Jehovah. And then in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, we see the five eyes. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. With a sense of pride will always come discontentment. Discontentment means I want more. Discontentment says I need more. Discontentment says, whether I deserve it or not, I will have more. He wanted to be like God himself. He, his pride deluded him so much that he claimed equality with God. The height of vanity, he says, I will be like God. It was this act of his will and rebellion that caused him to fall. O oh, Lucifer a place of prominent position, cast out of the glories of heaven. Why? Because of the sin of pride. You know, Satan didn't fall alone. His pride led him to spark a rebellion, induced a large number of angels to join him. In Revelation chapter 12, it says, a third of the stars of heaven were swept away. He identified the fallen angels with the demons and Satan's. Now, the question that has been asked is, in Revelation chapter 12, it says a third, so how many is that? Okay, what's the number? I have no idea. Okay? We know throughout Scripture, we see descriptions of angels. We see them in groups. We have no idea. It says in Revelation chapter 5, the number of holy angels being myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands. Now in the Greek, the word myriad means 10,000. That doesn't even begin to give us a glimpse of how many angels there were. 
Perhaps there were too many to count. But yet the sin of pride sparked rebellion. And a third of the angels were caught up in thinking that they were better than Creator God. Remember, recon is important. We not only learn the enemy, we learn a lot about ourselves, don't we? You know, Satan has a tie, though, and has some names, and, and I'm going to go through these rather quickly, but Satan is not an impersonal or evil force. He does, he does possess traits of personality and intellect, emotion, will. Furthermore, personal pronouns are used to describe him and his actions. This is a real being. Satan comes from the Hebrew word meaning adversary or opposer. He is an adversary of all things true. He is a relentless opponent. 1 Peter 5.8, be self-controlled, be alert. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We also know that he is called the accuser. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. He is the accuser. Look at the last part of that verse. He's out of here. He's been hurled down. Satan's desire is to cause us to condemn ourselves. Aren't you thankful that when we come to Christ, guess what? I am dressed in the clothes of righteousness, not because of anything that I have done, but because of what Christ has done in me and through me. Is God done working with you? Absolutely not. You know what? For those of you that are young, I'm not sure who the youngest person is here. And I'm certainly not going to tell you who I think the oldest person is. But what I will say is this. No matter if you are young or you are old, God is still working on you. And Satan would do everything that he can do to show you that you're no good. Because of the righteousness of God, guess what? God says, huh, not only are you good, you're mine. He is the accuser of the brethren. Lucifer means son of the morning, the shining one, the light bearer. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that Satan currently transforms himself into an angel of light, into something that would be beautiful to see. We would look at that and we would say, man, this is a great thing. Remember, Satan comes as an angel of light. He comes to deceive the world. In Revelation chapter 12, he is also called the dragon. He's called the devil in Matthew chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Peter 5, 8. The devil is used 35 times in scripture. The Greek word means that he is a slanderer. He is a liar. John 8, 44 says that he is a liar, and not only that, he's the father of lies. Revelation chapter 20 says that he is the deceiver. Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. In all ways that he can, Satan wants to lead us to believe whatever is not true true whatever is not accurate where is truth found truth is found right here satan is going to do everything he can to turn this around and to say that there is no truth the world that we live in today is so not full of truth how many of y'all have ever helped your children with schoolwork how about lately? Flo, I'm so glad I missed this new math. It's got to be. I, I tried following it once. I couldn't do it. I like to think I'm a rather 
smart guy. At least I know two plus two. Holy smokes, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how to get those answers. And for those of you laughing at me, your turn's coming. How's that? Okay. Well, there might be several ways to get to a problem. Let me tell you this. Two plus two still equals four. Okay. And as absurd of an illustration as this sounds, there are some people that would say two plus two equals three. Okay? Is that a true statement or a false statement? We all know that to be false, don't we? Okay, watch this. Jesus Christ had died for our sins according to the scripture. For those of us that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. True? True. But yet there are those that would say that is false. There are those that say this is a book of fairy tales and myths. There, there are those that would say we do not believe this. Let me tell you something. Folks, God's word is true. God's word is perfect. Don't ever forget that Satan, as the ruler of this world, will do everything that he can to oppose truth. He's the prince of the power of the air. In Revelation chapter 9, he's called the destroyer. He is out to shake your faith. He is out to get you. He is out to do everything to discredit the cause of Christ. He is the destroyer. He is the tempter. Matthew chapter 4, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. We also see that he is called the evil one. He is the God of this age. We talked about him being called the anointed cherub. He is called the serpent of old in Genesis chapter 3. A reflection of his deceit and his craftiness. He is also named Belial. It means without profit. Satan is without profit. He is worthless. He is wicked. He is called Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, which literally translated means the Lord of the flies. Think about that. 1 Peter 5.8 says that he is a roaring lion, describing himself as hungry and on the prowl. He is known by all of these names. And you know what? With these names does come some power. Not even a saved believer can defeat Satan's power apart from God's provided victory. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever think that you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and have a good day. Because we don't do it on our own. Guess what? The next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about spiritual armor. We're going to be talking about getting ready for battle. Because there are things that we need to do that we need to be prepared for. And it is each and every day. The soldiers of old would put on their armor. Do you know that that armor had a lot of weight associated with it? You know how big some of those shields were? You know how heavy some of those swords are? If I remember correctly, uh, uh, Gary has a sword. Seems like I remember that. He's given me this. Yeah, all right. You know what? Uh, back in the day, way back in the day, the swords were a lot heavier than what Gary has. The armor heavy, but yet it was required for battle that they be put on each and every day. We're going to see that it will be important for us to put on the full armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6. We know that Satan has a throne. I know where you live, it says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, where Satan has his throne. We know that he rules a kingdom. He masquerades 
as an angel of light. He has a meeting place. We know that he has the power to oppose the mightiest of angels. Even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. That is found in Jude chapter 9. He has the power to oppose. He maneuvers and holds in bondage the realm of lost men. He holds them in his very grasp. For those of you that have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, guess what? Who has you? Jesus Christ. And it is because of what he has done. Now, Harold, when I was in Bible college, they told me never to leave a message on a negative. Did you ever hear that? Yeah, they taught us that. Yeah. They said that's not a good thing because it's just not. You want to give people something. Let me give this to you. Greater is he. Okay. Recon, very important. What comes after recon? Getting ready for battle. And guess what? Going out and fighting the battle. It's one thing to know. Next week, we're going to get ready to go. We're going to get ready to fight. We're going to start putting some armor on. And I'm looking forward to that. Because this is something, friends, we need to do each and every day. This is something that is too important. We don't just skip a day. We don't say, I'm tired. But we get dressed for battle. Greater is he. Remember, Satan will do everything. condemn you of your past. We all have a past. You know, look at your watch. Yeah, and the amount of time it took, that was past. We all have a past. Satan will do everything to convict you of your past. Praise God, we remind him of the future that is in store for him. Greater is he. Be encouraged today, folks. Recon is important. We know what we're up against. Now we fight, and we fight under the power of Almighty God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the life that you have given to us. Father, we are, are blessed to know that, Father, you don't just leave us in this world to fight on our own, but, Lord, you give us the armor, Lord, that we need. Father, you give us the strength that we need. Lord, I pray that we would be found faithful, knowing that where you have us is where you want us. May we be content with where we are, Father, in the respect that we are your child. Father, there's no way we could be any more than, than what you are. Father, we are thankful that we call you Father, and we look to you, Father, for guidance, strength, mercy, and grace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.